Hello everybody, this is Jörg Lissmann once again from YouTube channel Juggler66 and I'm going to do another reading of the book Rulers of Evil from F. Tupper Saucy now on chapter 10 called Definitions. Just to go a little bit back to explain to you what the definitions are about, we ended the reading in chapter 9 and the last paragraph reads as follows. Despite its ascendancy over American life, few Americans understand the term Jesuit. In our next chapter, definition, chapter 10, we shall examine, examine how this term is defined in our basic reference works. These definitions will help us to better understand the kind of character produced by Ignatian psychological technique. So, then we go into chapter 10. The term Jesuit was first used to describe a member of the Society of Jesus in 1559. It did not originate from within the society, but from outsiders. Whether intended derisively or, der derisively, sorry, or respectfully, Jesuit does appear to have been inspired. We find in the Bible, in Numbers 26 verse 44, the mention of Jesuits. The Jesuits are the progeny of Jesuai, whose name in the Hebrew Yishvivi means level. The Jesuits certainly leveled the Protestant menace. Jesuai was a great grandson of Abraham. His father was the, was the Israelite tribal chieftain Asher. Asher means happy. At Genesis 49, verse 20, Asher's posterity is divinely prophesied, uh, prophesied to yield royal deities delights, their uniquely privileged access to the minds and wills of kings has certainly enabled the Jesuits to yield copious harvests of royal delights. But in fulfilling their scriptural propos prophecy, the Jesuits seem to have alienated themselves from people who use the English language. This does not disappoint St. Ignatius. Quote, Let us hope, he once wrote, that the society may never be left untroubled by the hostility of the world for, every, for very long. Unquote. America's first indigenous dictionary was compiled by Noah Webster, and published in 1828. His American Dictionary of the English Language reflects the place held by the Jesuits in the opinion of a public whose senior citizens had brought forth the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Webster himself was 41 when the Constitution was ratified. Jesuit, one of the Society of Jesus, so-called, founded by Ignatius Loyola, a society remarkable for their cunning in, propagation, in propagating their principles. Jesuited, conforming to the principles of the Jesuits. Jesuitess, a female Jesuit in principle, even though I do not know how many examples of female Jesuits there are. Jesuitic or Jesuitical, pertaining to the Jesuits or their principles and arts. Designing, cunning, deceitful, prevaricating, and Jesuitically is craftily. Now, the explanation in Webster's given on Jesuitism is as follows. The arts, principles and practices of the Jesuits. Cunning, deceit, hypocrisy, prevarication, deceptive practices to effect a purpose. 178 years later, Webster's third New International Dictionary from 1986 informs us that the language has not repented. Jesuit, explained as a member of a religious society for men founded by Ignatius Loyola in 1534. Second, to given, one given to intrigue or equivocation, a crafty person. Casuist, where we derive the word casuistry from, I guess. Jesuit, uh, Jesuited means Jesuitic, and Jesuitic or Jesuitical, according to 1986 Webster's Dictionary, first explanation, 
of or relating to the Jesuits, Jesuitism or Jesuitry. Second, having qualities thought to resemble those of a Jesuit. USU used disparingly. And Jesuit ties. <coughs> to act or teach in the actual or ascribed manner of a Jesuit. To indoctrinate with actual or ascribed Jesuit principles. Jesuit III. Principles or practices ascribed to the Jesuits as the practice of mental reservation, casuistry and equivocation. <coughs> equivocation sorry. Webster's Online Dictionary www Webster 1999 is particularly revealing. Here we read that Jesuit means quote, a member of the Roman Catholic Society of Jesus founded by Saint Ignatius Loyola in 1534 and devoted to missionary and educational work unquote. and that a Jesuit is quote, one given to intrigue or equivocation unquote. W. W. Webster defines Quote, to intrigue as meaning quote, to cheat, trick, plot and scheme and to equivocate as to quote, equivocal language especially with intent to deceive, to avoid committing oneself in what one says. Unquote. Equivocal language according to the same source is language quote, subject to two or more interpretations and usually used to mislead or confuse, of uncertain nature or disposition toward a person or thing, or doubtful advantage, genuineness or moral rectitude." Unquote. The Jesuit discipline has evalu uh, elevated mental reservation, casuistry and equivocation to high arts. You will not find a more hilarious defense of these arts than Blaise Pascal classic Pastoral Letters from 1657, freely available on the Internet, purportedly written to a friend, the letters report conversations Pascal is having with a Jesuit casuist. The Jesuit defends his arts thusly, quote, Men have arrived at such a pitch of corruption nowadays that, unable to make them come to us, we must e and go to them. Oh, uh, we must e apostrophe e n go to them. So I don't understand this writing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I' gonna repeat the sentence because this is a word that I do not. Uh, I'm not familiar with. Quote: Men have arrived at such a pitch of corruption nowadays that, unable to make them come to us, we must then go to them. Otherwise, they would cast us off altogether, and what is worse, they would become perfect castaways. It is to retain such characters as these that our causists have taken under consideration the vices to which people of various conditions are most addicted, with the view of laying down maxims which, while they cannot be said to violate the truth, are so gentle that he must be a very impractical subject in, indeed who is not pleased with them. The grand project of our society, for the good of religion, is never to repulse anyone, let him be what he may, and so avoid driving people to despair." Unquote. Jesuit moral theology hardly needs a satirist. Its humor is self-contained. Consider Hermann Busenbaum, one of the society's most venerated moral theologians. Busenbaum literally wrote, the book on self-serving logic. His celebrated Medulla Theola, uh, Theola, Theologiae Moralis, or The Marrow of Moral Theology from 1645, enjoyed more than 200 printings and was required ethics reading in all the Jesuit colleges. A man of stout appetites, Busenbaum constructed an equivocation to relieve himself of the obligation to eat fish on Friday. Quote, on Fridays every good Catholic must eat only creatures that live in the water, which justifies ordering a nice roast duck. Unquote. Busenbaum demonstrated how mental reservation could 
enable a criminal to escape a charge of breaking and entering. Quote, Did you force the window to gain felonious entry into these premises? asked the judge. Certainly not, replies the accused, qualifying his denial with the mental reservation, quote, I entered through the skylight, unquote. Father Gury, who taught moral theology at the Roman College from his book Casus Conscientiae, 1875, approved of that way an adulterous life, having just received absolution for her sin from a priest, used mental reservation to mislead her husband. Quote, to the entreaties of her husband, she absolutely denied the fault. Quote, I have not committed it, unquote, she said, meaning, quote, adultery such as I am obliged to reveal, unquote. In other words, quote, I have not committed an adultery, unquote. She could deny her sin as a culprit may say to a judge who does not question him legitimately, quote, I have not committed any crime, adding mentally, in such a manner that I should reveal it, unquote. This is the opinion of St. Liguori and many others. And just a little insert from myself here. This reminds me very much of President Jesuit Georgetown University by Carol Quigley, educated Bill Clinton, who said, I did not have sexual relationships with that woman. You remember that one? Now look that up in the sense that now you know this Jesuitical casuistry and of course you will really see the real meaning of that what Bill Clinton said at that time. The Saint Liguori to whom Guy refers is Alfonso Liguori, declared patron saint of confessors and moralists by Pope Pius XII. Saint Liguori was not a Jesuit himself, but he was devoted to them. He facilitated adultery by means of an equivoc equivocation. Quote, an adulteress questioned by her husband may deny her guilt by declaring that she has not committed adultery, meaning idolatry, for which the term adultery is often employed in the Old Testament. Unquote. Casuistry is the process of applying moral principles falsely in deciding the rights or wrongs of a case. The word casuistry comes from cases. W. W. Webster equates casuistry with rationalization, to cause something to seem reasonable, to provide plausible but untrue reasons for conduct. In early 1999, President Clinton's biographer, David Marinus, could be seen remarking on talk shows that the president owed his formidable skills as a criminal defendant to, uh, quote, his training in casuistry at Georgetown University. <laughs> what did I just tell you a few minutes ago? <laughs> the great Jesuit casuist Antonio Escobar pardoned evildoing as long as it was committed in pursuit of a lofty goal. Mm -hmm. Quote, purity of intention, unquote, he declared in 1627, quote, may justify actions which are contrary to the moral code and to human laws, unquote. Hermann Busenbaum ratified Escobar with his own famous maxim, quote, cum finis est licitus etiam media sunt licita, unquote, meaning, if the end is legal, the means are legal. Or, in other words, <laughs> the, uh, the end justifies the means, so Escobar and Busenbaum boil down to the essential doctrine of terrorism. The end justifies the means. And this, of course, you have first come across when you go through the Oaths of the Jesuits, the false oaths of induction. Now, casuistry solved the problem of usury. Although the voice of Jesus commanded, quote, lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward will be great, unquote, as stated in Luke 6, verse 35, 
Jesuit lenders often charged exorbitant, exorbitant interests. Father Gury explained the principle. If lending 100 francs you are losing 10 francs by it, you lend really 110 francs, then you shall receive 110 francs." Unquote. Indeed, the casuist tree has set the moral tone of world economics. In his Universae Theologiae Moralis, meaning Catholic Moral Theology, 1652 to 1666, Antonio Escobar rendered the opinion that, quote, the giving of short weight is not to be reckoned as a sin, when the official price for certain goods is so low that the merchant would be ruined thereby, unquote. By this reasoning, the international network of central banks, beginning with the Knights Templars and sustained by the Society of Jesus, has been absolved of manipulating monetary values and doing, in doing so helps individual sovereign nation-states manage their subjects. Subjects are cyclically required to part with true value, that is, hard-earned gold and silver coinage, in exchange for intangible credit denominated in paper notes whose official promises to repay in precious coinage are cyclically broken. As the most powerful office in Roman Catholicism, the Black Papacy might have promoted stable national economies by means of the divinely fair monetary system commanded in the Bible at Leviticus 19. Quote, Ye shall do no unrighteousness in measure. Just balances, just weights shall ye have. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. Unquote. Instead, it has promoted Escobar's casuistry, which directs merchants to survive official value manipulations by cheating one another. There are significant sociological consequences. When giving short weight becomes policy, a moral paradigm is set. That paradigm governs more than just commercial transactions. It affects human relationships as well. Partners in friendships, marriages and families begin giving short weight, giving less than present represented. This result in one-sided, frustrating, dysfunctional, emotional transactions and ultimately an aberrant society. The ultimate beneficiary of aberrant societies, of course, is Pontifex Maximus, whose profession is their regulation. If we depend solely on dictionary definitions, we learn that Jesuits are churchmen and teachers of a doubtful moral rectitude who are likely to cheat, trick, plot, scheme, deceive and confuse us while avoiding to commit themselves verbally. When we study their published moralists, we sense a rather vibrant presence of the trickster. But in the society's defense, it must be said, these are legitimate characters, traits for a militia empowered by a declaration of war. And we must remember that Paul III's bull ordaining the Society of Jesus, Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae, is just such a declaration. Human life in a declared war becomes subject to the first great rule of war, belly legum dormit. In, the war, in war the law sleeps. When the law sleeps, the unarmed priest's only weapons are the intrigue, deceit, equivocation, casuistry and mental reservation with which the Jesuits have made themselves so notorious and so often despised. In forthcoming chapters we shall be examining how the Society of Jesus made war against Great Britain and the British colonies during the second half of the 18th century and then again the sovereign American states a century later. In each instance the warfare was of the highest sophistication. It was to so subtly conceived and so masterfully executed that neither of the major combatants could discern the presence of Jesuits in the equation. The amazing technology of Jesuit warfare, that is the subject of our next chapter. That will be chapter 11. And chapter 11 then starts 
with the title The Thirteen Articles Concerning Military Art. I have the idea that this is taken from the Jesuits' constitution, but let's see what it's all about. I think uh, Tupper Saucy went through quite a research to explain all this to us, as he did all the other things coming our way here. And I think that you, dear listener, now will have already a much better view on who the Jesuits are after reading this and, of course, when you follow our or my um, broadcast on Hour of the Truth, most certainly the last one um, that was uploaded just a few days ago. So for you to see that, I advise you to go to the playlist on Hour of the Truth and uh, watch the videos embedded in that playlist. Now, the 13 articles concerning military art, chapter 11 of Rulers of Evil. Before the American Revolution, Roman Catholics were barred from voting or holding public office throughout the British colonies. They were a persecuted minority everywhere but in the propriety domain of William Penn from Pennsylvania and Delaware. Some of their most energetic persecutors, in fact, were the Huguenots, whom the Catholics had chased out of France in the wake of Louis XIV's revocation of the Edict of Nantes. I want to go a little bit more deep into um, the person mentioned here, William Penn from Pennsylvania and Delaware, because I have a very interesting quote that he said, and this goes as follows. Quote, Men must be governed by God, or they will be ruled by tyrants. William Penn, founder of and first governor of Pennsylvania, 1644 to 1718. Men must be governed by God, or they will be ruled by tyrants. Now how goes that together that they, the Jesuits, were persecuted minority everywhere, but in the propriety of domain of William Penn, this same person. So he protected the Jesuits, and on the other hand he said, Men must be governed by God, or they will be ruled by tyrants. So I guess that he very well knew what he was talking about, because the tyrants are the ones that he harbored at that time. The basis of Roman Catholic persecution was political. Catholics owed allegiance to Pontifex Maximus, the Bishop of Rome. The Bishop of Rome was a foreign ruler who, as a matter of public policy, regarded the British king and his Protestant church as heretics to be destroyed. From the American colonists' standpoint, to allow Catholics to vote or hold office, was tantamount to surrendering their colonies to a foreign conqueror. A crucial part of maintaining personal liberty in Protestant colonial America was keeping Roman Catholics out of the government. But then came the revolution. The colonial citizenry fought for and won their independence from Great Britain. They established a constitution that amounted to surrendering their country to a foreign conqueror. Consider the legalities. Before the Constitution was ratified, American Catholics had few civil rights. After ratification, they had them all. Article 4, Section 3 provides that, quote, no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the authority of the United States. While the First Amendment denies Congress the power to, quote, to make any law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, unquote. With Article 4, Section 3 and the First Amendment, the Constitution welcomed agents of Pontifex Maximus, the world's chief enemy of Protestantism, into the ranks of government. And I have a little bit to insert here from myself that you understand that. When you follow my channel a little bit, and certainly the broadcasts I'm doing regularly now on Hour of the Truth, then you know how we discover in these broadcasts, and with the documents that we have been looking up, and all the books and all the quotations from documents, letters from the Founding Fathers, and so on, that it was the intention of the Roman Catholic Church to break up to break up the relation between the colonies and Protestant England at that time. 
you have to understand that the Jesuits tried for a long time to get a hold on Great Britain. They tried it with the Spanish Armada, they, stri they tried it with um, what in America was celebrated at that time, Guy Fawkes Day, the gunpowder plot that you maybe remember. They were recognized by the English as the power that tried to get the Roman Catholic Church have a foot in Protestant, at that time Protestant Great Britain, England. And they didn't. So, the Jesuits or the Roman Catholic Church, or both together, decided if we cannot get England, then we will get the colonies. Take them apart out of the empire, of the English empire that ruled the world more or less at that time, and found within these colonies a nation that we have absolutely under control. That's why the Revolutionary War, that's why the founding of the nation and uh, introducing the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and all these papers that were there for the people, don't get me wrong here, that were there for the people, but to get a door open for the Catholics. When you understand that the Catholics were not allowed to hold any office in the colonies at that time, and all that changed with the Declaration of Independence and the introduction of the Constitution, where the first amendment um, it said, uh, in, 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 uh, uh, where in the Constitution it says, freedom of religion, there you give up the Protestant rights. I hope you understand that, because, let us be clear, in the Kingdom of God, there is no freedom of religion. What did God say in Exodus 20, when he gave the Ten Commandments to the God-believing people called Israel at that time? Quote, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Unquote. As in the King James Version, Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. So, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Is that freedom of religion? No, that is not freedom of religion, but that is the freedom of God telling the people, I made the world, I even took you out of bondage, and therefore you should worship me and no other God. I am your God and there is no other. That is not freedom of religion, but that is the freedom of conscience spoken by God, whether you accept it or you don't accept it. But I think that through the reading I have done up to here, that you absolutely have to understand now, and if you don't understand then I guess you are not spiritually honest to agree with me on that, that everyone in the American colonies, I mean, get it, the people fled from Europe at that time. And why did they flee from Europe? Because they were suppressed. They had no freedom of conscience, they had no freedom of speech, they had no freedom of anything. It was the rule of the Pontifex Maximus all over the old Europe at that time until um, the Reformation set them free. And where the Reformation was countered by the Counter-Reformation, people fled. And they fled into the so-called New World, which is America. And they set up rules there that they would govern themselves, would be governed by God, but would not be governed by a foreign uh, king, which is Pontifex Maximus, which is the Pope of Rome. Yeah? They made rules, that's why they forbade the Catholics to, held, to hold office, that's why they forbade the Catholics to hold open mass. They did not want to have anything to do with the Catholic tradition. 
they wanted to have everything to do with the Bible and the way that they uh, that the Bible and God leads their conscience to free speech and to all the other things that we have achieved through the Reformation. So, when there were laws made to protect Protestantism in the early colonies, and then all of a sudden, in 1776, you get the founding of a nation, and that does all of a sudden, <laughs> nice expression, all of a sudden, I use that a lot, right? Makes an end to the limitations of the rights that Catholics have. You understand probably that Catholics must have very much rejoiced when, of course, the Constitution came in effect, because that opened the door for them to practice their idolatrous religion in the former Protestant, where it was forbidden, colonies. And that's why the Jesuits took it over and founded the United States of America. And to get a better understanding of that, just watch my latest upload on Hour of the Truth that was just done yesterday. And the title is Hour of the Truth XXL America's Founding Fathers Blasphemed Jesus Christ, episode 18 of Hour of the Truth. You can find that in the playlist. Uh, watch it and see it in the context of the reading that I'm doing here, and then you will see where it all leads to. Okay, I will continue reading now in uh, chapter 11. Of the 2,500,000 enumerated inhabitants in 1787, America, the Roman, uh, in 1787 America, the Roman Catholic population consisted of no more than 16,000 in Maryland, 7,000 in Pennsylvania, where this pen uh, was seated, 1,500 in New York and 200 in Virginia. Once the Constitution was in place, a steady influx of European immigrants transformed Roman Catholicism from America's smallest to America's largest religious denomination. By 1850, the higher power at Rome could view the United States as a viable tributary, if not another papal state. This awesome result did not just happen. I submit that it was brilliantly designed and commanded by a man I am pleased to honor as the American Republic's last known founding father, Lorenzo Ricci. Ricci was a Tuscan aristocrat by birth, a stoical philosopher by reputation, and a Jesuit father by profession. He was superior general of the Society of Jesus during the formative years of the American Revolution, from 1758 until 1775. He also may be credited with having written the most celebrated treatise on war ever published, a work entitled The Thirteen Articles Concerning Military Art. The reputed author of this work is a quasi-historical Chinese general believed to have lived in the 6th century BC, named Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu was unknown to Western languages until Joseph Marie Amiot, astronomer to the Emperor of China, brought forth a French edition of the Thirteen Articles in 1772. Amiot was a Jesuit priest under obedience to General Ritchie. I base my inference that Ritchie is the author of Amiot's Sun Tzu on a remark from today's premier Jesuit spokesman, Malachi Martin, retired professor at the Pontifical Institute in Rome, to the effect that a book written by a Jesuit, due to the obedience factor, can be presumed, in essence, to be the work of his superior general. Amiot's Sun Tzu, then, can be presumed to have been written by Lorenzo Ricci. The Black Pope's decision to publish Sun Tzu's prior to the outbreak of the revolution, he had engineered demonstrates, I believe, his confidence that divine authority has already, had already delivered victory to him. Ricci knew that circumstances had reached the point at which there was nothing which his enemy, the forces of Protestantism on both sides of the Atlantic, could do to alter the outcome. 
He was like a chess master who sees the inevitability, uh, inevitability of checkmate four moves ahead and reveals his winning method out of courtesy to the imminent loser. His method was so sublimely San Tzuan that uh, was, so, uh, was so sublimely San Tzuan that his opponents never ever perceived his army to be an opponent, just as Protestants today are unaware that extirpating their credo is still the unrelenting Jesuit mission. The thirteen articles were ignored by Americans until the, 19th, uh, until the 1970s, when our corporate executives discovered that their oriental counterparts were doing business according to, to Sun Tzuan strategies. As US corporations increased their presence in the Pacific Rim, Sun Tzu became a major survival tool. Since the middle 80s, more than 50 editions of the articles have been published in this country, mostly under the Art of War title. These editions represent Sun Tzu well enough, but none of them are derived from the 1772 Amir translation into French, which itself was based on a Tatar Manchurian version of the older Chinese manuscripts. Amir's Sun Tzu appears never to have been published in English, although a 1996 commission by Le Bel Eglise produced a very fine manuscript English translation by Hermine F. Garcia. That manuscript is the source of my citations here. Only the Amiot edition reflects in virtually, in, uh, in virtually the Jesuit general's own words how he formed the United States of America by dividing the British Empire against itself. And what does the Bible say? An empire divided in itself cannot stand. While at the same time dividing the rest of Europe against Britain, against even the general's own army. The Amiot is all the more remarkable for appearing in the very midst of the unfolding of this extraordinary process. Amiot begins the 13 articles by noting how odd it is that the benign Chinese morality should spawn a warrior of Sun Chu's magnitude. Quote, if we are to judge the Chinese by their morals, and in general by everything one can currently observe on them, he would instantly conclude that this must be the most pacifist, pacifist nation in the world, far from having the brilliant qualities necessary for warriors. Yet, surprisingly, this very nation, which has subsisted for nearly 4,000 years in approximately the same state we see it in today, has always, or almost always, triumphed over its enemies and when it had the misfortune of being conquered, it gave its laws to the conquerors themselves." Unquote. We know this, Amiot says, from the annals, which contain quote, admirable accounts of prodigious bravery, unquote, and lists of actions and military conduct of various founders of dynasties. He exclaims, quote, What heroes! What politicians! What warriors! No Alexander or Caesar could surpass them. Why shouldn't these great men, these powerful geniuses, who made such fine political and civil laws, have made military laws which were just as fine?" Unquote. The reference to Caesar is significant. Declaring China's dynastic heroes to be Caesar's equals Emiot equates Lorenzo Ricci, the reigning bearer of Caesarian authority, with the greatest Oriental warriors, where the Oriental military laws, quote, just as fine, unquote, as Caesar's, quote, it is not up to me to judge this, unquote, Emiot answers, quote, our warriors must pronounce themselves in this regard, unquote. If the term our warriors means our Jesuit brethren, as I believe it does, then we have before us Ritchie's clandestine order that the book be received by the scattered members of the society, as the latest statement on, of the general's military law, clandestine general's order clandestinely. 
Amiot admits that translating a war manual was, quote, contrary to my taste and so far from the object of my profession, unquote. He says that he only undertook the work in hopes that the reader might have, quote, some pleasure conversing with these foreign heroes and receiving some of their instructions and finding something useful, unquote. What cannot be denied is that Rome was served by critical events in America and England during the years of Ritchie's reign in ways that flow quite discernibly uh, from the strategies, laws and maxims set forth in the Thirteen Articles. I believe that anyone reading Amiot's Sun II in 1772, knowing that its translator was a Jesuit, knowing the Jesuit mission and knowing the nature of Jesuitic obedience, could observe world events with this knowledge and predict that the dispute between the American colonists and the British Empire would end, as it actually did, in Roman dominance over a few independent republic. Before presenting the works of Sun Tzu, Amiot recounts an important legend demonstrating the severity of Sun Tzuan authority. It is a severity that empowers the general to overrule even his sovereign in order to secure the army's perfect obedience. Hearing that the king of O was preparing for war and not wishing to remain idle, Sun Tzu offered his services to the king. The king had read Sun Tzu's book and liked it, but doubted its practicability. Quote, Prince, replied Sun Tzu, <coughs> I said nothing in my writings that I had not already practiced in the army. What I have not yet said, but of which I presume to assure your majesty today, is that I am capable of transmitting these practices to anyone, whomsoever, and training them in military exercises when I am authorized to do so. Unquote. I understand, replied the king. You wish to say that you will easily teach your maxims to intelligent men who are already both prudent and valorous and that you will have no difficulty giving training in military exercises to men accustomed to hard work, who are docile and full of good will. But the majority is not of that nature. Unquote. It matters not, replied Sun Tzu. Quote, I said, anyone, whomsoever, uh, and I exclude no one from my offer, including the most uh, mutinous, <coughs> the most cowardly, and the weakest of men." Unquote. To hear you speak, said the king, quote, you would even inspire women to have the feelings of warriors. You would train them to bear arms. Unquote. Yes, prince, replied Sun Tzu in a firm voice, and I beg your majesty to be assured of it. Unquote. The king who in, who in the circumstances in which he found himself was no longer entertained by the customary amusement of court, took advantage of his opportunity to find a new sort of amusement. He said, Bring me 180 of my wives. He was obeyed, and the princesses appeared. Among them there were two in particular, whom the king loved tenderly. They were placed ahead of the others. We will see said the king, smiling. We will see, Sun Tzu, if you will be true to your word. I make you general of these new troops. All throughout my palace you need only choose the place which seems the most comfortable to give them military training. When they are sufficiently instructed, you will let me know, and I will come myself to render justice to them and to your talent.' 